Yeah. And good evening, everybody. Uh, just waiting for a couple more people uh, coming in through the door here, but uh, I think we'll be okay to start uh, with some introductory comments. Well, welcome. Welcome to a special Passover edition of Ted Med Talks. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Eddie Lang. And I am, um, most importantly, a member, a proud member of the board here at Beth Tzedek. But I also am the department head for emergency medicine in Calgary. And uh, together with the planning committee that includes Rabbi Osachi, we have the great honor and pleasure of organizing these Tzed Med presentations with great collaboration from the University of Calgary. Uh, this is, I've lost track, this is our fourth, perhaps, Said Med Talks over the last two years. We've had fascinating presentations and covering topics as wide ranging as uh, most recently, uh, the, one, the last one we had in the fall was on the eve of the legalization of cannabis. We've had special presentations by uh, outside guests from uh, Ontario on disaster preparedness. Uh, Dr. Kolick was, uh, has done a lot of work in Israel. And also, we've had uh, Dr. Gil Kaplan presenting on gastrointestinal diseases. So just a couple of introductory things. I'd like to thank everybody for making the effort to come out tonight. It's great to see an, a great turnout. And uh, before I introduce our special guest, very excited about the topic and the presentations this evening, I'll just turn things over to Rabbi Osachi, who'd like to make some uh, welcoming remarks. Thank you, Eddie. Um, just very briefly, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Lang for his time and effort in putting this program together, the series of programs. It's really a, a wonderful opportunity for us to collaborate with the university. Uh, oftentimes people think of the university as a far away distant institution, but this is a way in which we bring that institution into our own community and really glean some of the important research and work that's being done. The, the synagogue, of course, is always interested in helping people to um, integrate mind, body, and spirit. And so these programs really have to do with uh, all of those aspects of who we are. And so our health is really a, a combination of these different concerns that we have about different aspects of who we are. So this program in particular is just uh, want you to know it's a prophylactic program. Uh, because when anyone here reaches that point in life, you'll, this, this information is going to be healthy, helpful for when you start to age. So, so please take notes. Um, speaking of notes, just a, a final comment. So all of our lectures have been uh, videoed and they're online. So if you, if you missed one, you can go on and see it at your leisure or you can refer to other people. Uh, who haven't, uh, haven't had the opportunity to be here with us to go online and see these as well. So thank you for being here and look forward to hearing our guests. Thank you, Rabbi. And so without further ado, I'd like to introduce our two amazing uh, guest speakers for tonight. Uh, presenting first will be Dr. Jaina Holroyd Leduc. Dr. Leduc, Holroyd Leduc is a professor uh, in, of geriatrics in the Department of Medicine at the University of Calgary and is the Vice Chair for Academic uh, Affairs. I've, I've had the very good fortune of collaborating with uh, Jaina on a number of projects over the years. Most recently, uh, she's been successful in obtaining a fairly sizable grant from the provincial government that allows us to study better ways of transferring frail elderly from nursing homes to the emergency department when they get uh, sick. And it's always been a, a pleasure to uh, work with her and always has great ideas. I'll go ahead and introduce the second speaker. Uh, each presenter will talk for about 25 minutes or so, and then we'll have ample opportunity for uh, questions. Uh, the topic tonight is vitally important. And then I believe the synagogue is uh, offering us some uh, delicious Passover snacks. I hope, there I hope people have room for a couple more macaroons is, is, the, main, is the main thing. So Dr. Zainur Ismail is a, an associate professor in the Department of Psychiatry and is what we call in, at the University of Calgary a rising star. He's doing amazing research in the area of dementia and how it overlaps with psychiatry and the ability to detect um, early dementia I think is also one of his uh, main areas of focus. 
So uh, really thrilled that both of these uh, rising amazing researchers at the University of Calgary uh, have, are thrilled to join us and have, will have the opportunity to share their thoughts on some of the most important things we need to think about as our brains are aging and how we're trying to stay healthy. So I will turn the microphone over to Dr. Halroy Leduc. So, so good evening and thank you for the invitation. I'm going to cover um, some evidence around how can you actually successfully age. And um, I know we like to think none of us are aging, but actually from the day you're born, moving on, you're effectively aging. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about actually will be relevant uh, across the lifespan. So hopefully there's tidbits for everybody that's here. So just to give you an overview, we're going to talk a bit about what's happening in Canada in terms of our demographics. I'm going to discuss what frailty is, and particularly frailty with aging. We'll talk about some strategies associated with how you can successfully age. I wanted to give you an overview, too, of advanced care planning, um, particularly in the Alberta context, if you're not already familiar, very important topic. And then at the end, just briefly touch on some caregiver resources around um, the Calgary area, because um, uh, probably several of you are caregivers of others uh, in the room. So if we look at life expectancy in Canada, we're actually seventh highest in the world. So we have quite a high life expectancy. The average life expectancy is almost 83 years. Women still live um, a bit longer than men. So men live just under 81 years, and women, um, the mean is almost 85 years. And the top five causes of death, probably no surprise. It's still coronary um, heart disease, although number two is now Alzheimer's and dementia, which you'll learn more about from Dr. Ishmael. Lung cancer is still a leading cause, as is lung disease, and then stroke rounds out the top five. So what's happening in Canada? So the Canadian population is actually aging faster than elsewhere in the world. And the proportion of those over 65 is ever increasing. And actually the, most, the quickest growing group uh, in Canada is those over 85. Um, so if we think about right now, there's about four and a half working adults for every one senior. However, by 2025, that's going to go down to 2.8 working adults for every senior. So you can imagine our demographic is changing. And I don't know if any of you saw this. This was in, made the press a couple years ago. But basically in Canada in, I think it was 2015, the, um, those over 65 now outnumber um, those under 15 in Canada. So you can see the two bottom curves. That's, that's crossing. So the, our population is definitely aging which isn't a bad thing, it just means we need to prepare um, for uh, differences in our demographic. So what is happening? So as we shift the aging curve, unfortunately what we haven't um, figured out in medicine is so we're very good at keeping people alive, but we aren't so good about preventing what we call morbidity or all the complications that can happen as we age and we accumulate diseases. So what's happening is although people are living longer, unfortunately there's more and more people that are living with chronic diseases and living with what we call frailty. So you can see the curve is, is um, shifting as far as age, but our uh, independence and in function um, is going down. So what is frailty? So frailty is a health state. It's defined basically as a state of increased vulnerability to health, adverse health outcomes, and that's compared to others your own age. So we don't compare an 80-year-old to a 20-year-old, we compare two 80-year-olds. So amongst two 80-year-olds, someone that's frail is more likely to have um, an adverse health outcome or an adverse health event than somebody who is more robust. Um, it results from a reduced physiologic reserve and a loss in, in function across multiple systems. And it re basically reduces our ability to cope with normal or even minor health stressors. So something minor that maybe when we were younger and more robust could have been dealt with by a visit to our family doctor and some antibiotics or some other treatment may result in us ending up in acute care and even hospitalized. So it's associated with increased risk of physical, cognitive, and functional decline and adverse health outcomes, um, including uh, mortality, although the bigger concern is the fact that um, when you're frail, you're at higher risk to losing your independence and your, um, your basic activities of daily living. So if we look at, at aging and frailty, they're not synonymous. Um, however, frailty does become more common as, as we age. So, um, if we look at the population over 65, almost 25% of the population over 65 is going to have some degree of frailty, which actually on the plus sides means that 75% of those people over 65 are still relatively robust and living independently. 
As we age, once we reach 85, about half the population will be considered frail, and whereas the other half is robust, so about a 50-50 chance. Although I don't want you to think about frailty as you're absolute, absolutely frail or you're absolutely robust, it's actually a continuum. So people range from being very robust, so the, you know, those are the people that are running the Boston Marathon at 90 years old, and there would be the ro very robust, right up to people that are nearing the end of life, and, and all the grades in between. So it's really a continuum. But this just gives some aspects. And the important thing is that our health status is actually more, um, that our frailty is more a predictor of our outcome than age is. So we really should be thinking about, when we think about making care decisions, is how robust are we and or how frail, how much at risk are we for adverse health outcomes. Um, so um, just move on to the next slide. So if we look at frailty in the Canadian healthcare systems, patients with frailty are really overrepresented in the healthcare system, which is not surprising, right? So I just said when you're frail, you tend to have um, higher risk of an adverse health outcome, minor stressors can um, have big impact on you. So if we look at, if we went into the um, any hospital in um, Calgary right now, we'd probably see that about 60% of, of those within an, any acute care facility in Calgary or anywhere in Canada will be those that are, are older, so those over 65. Almost all those in residential care are frail. So we know that in, if we look at long-term care in particular, over 80% will have some degree of cognitive impairment and pretty much all of them by definition are frail because they all are in long-term care because they're needing assistance with their day-to-day -day activities. We also, an issue with frailty is something called polypharmacy. So that's a fancy word which basically means increasing number of drugs and potentially increasing inappropriate drugs or the increasing risk of drugs interacting with, e with each other or interacting with your health status. Um, so that's a, that's a big issue in, um, amongst the frail population. And then as we've already said, frailty is associated with adverse outcomes and with mortality. So what can we all do in terms of, of keeping ourselves robust and decreasing our risk of becoming frail? So there's some really um, bread and butter sort of things that, this should not be any surprise, but the lucky thing is, is there's evidence and it's e things you can easily do. So one thing is not smoking, so don't take up smoking. If you are a smoker, efforts to reduce smoking, there's lots of strategies you can talk to your family doctors about around trying to cut back on your smoking. Consuming moderate alcohol, and I'm going to talk more about alcohol because that's a bit controversial. Very importantly is being physically active, and that doesn't just mean going to the gym for 20 to 40 minutes three times a week and then the rest of the time staying in it, sitting, um, sort of watching TV or sitting at, at your job. It means actually being physically active, so getting, getting up and walk, park your car further away and walk to the entrance of the stores, take the flight of stairs if you're able to, that, that sort of day-to-day -day is trying to just day-to-day -day keep more active. And actually, um, I'll get more into the recommendations, but basically the recommendation is two and a half hours per week of moderate exercise and one hour, um, or one hour per week of vigorous, vigorous exercise. Although, as I said, just being physically active throughout your day is even better. And then the fourth um, thing that they looked at was eating fruits and vegetables every day. So these were the four healthy behaviors that they, they um, looked at in the study I'm going to present. So, What's the positive influence on healthy behaviors such as these? So they followed um, over 5,000 people between the ages of 42 to 63. So this is a, a population that is middle-aged, middle, middle aged, um, and they followed them for 16 years. And, what, and they looked at if, how much you participated with those four activities. So I said not smoking, consuming um, moderate alcohol, eating fruits and vegetables every day, and being physically active. The, how often when you did that thing were you more likely to successfully age? And they defined successful aging quite broadly. So it was having good cognitive, physical, respiratory, and cardiovascular function, and the absence of disability, mental health issues, or chronic disease. And what they found is that if you practiced in all four healthy b behaviors, you were three times more likely to successfully age. And there was what they um, would call a linear relationship between the number of behaviors practiced and the successful aging. So that means for every one of those things you do, the, the more um, power to successfully age. So even if you can't do all four, even doing one, there's some benefit to that than not doing any of them. So let's talk about exercise or, or physical activity. And just to define, so physical activity is just movement. And it's movement, it doesn't have to have to be going to the gym. With exercise, people tend to think more about going to the gym or doing an organized sport. So there is a, there is a bit of a difference when you get into that literature, but we won't get too caught up on that. But um, just to define exercise, so the World Health Organization actually recommends that we all do 600 met minutes of physical activity per week. So what does that mean? Well, a MET is a metabolic equivalent of task. 
and it basically measures an individual's energy expenditure. And 600 METs is about 150 minutes of brisk walking or 75 minutes of running. Okay, so they're basically to meet the requirements of the World Health Organization, you need to be briskly walking 150 minutes um, per, per week. The, this is a really interesting study, and I'm not going to propose that we all become marathon runners, and a lot of these people must have been, but this is a study that came out of Australia that actually showed high levels of activity may actually be a key to successful aging, which just reinforces the the, the thought that we do need to be stay active as people. We need to be moving our bodies. So what they looked at in Australia was 1,584 individuals that were 50 years or older, and they were all healthy at baseline, and they followed them for 10 years. And they th found, um, so they defined successful aging similar to the other study. It was the absence of depressive symptoms, disability, cognitive impairment, respiratory symptoms, and chronic disease. And they found that those that engaged in the highest levels of total activity, so these are people that are doing over 5,000 METs. Remember I said 600 METs was about 150 minutes of brisk walking, so you can imagine these people are really active. Um, if they did over 5,000 METs each week, they were more likely to successfully age compared to those that with the, they defined as lower activity, so less than 1,000 METs. So I'm not saying you all need to go out and become, uh, you know, professional athletes, but there is a relationship. The more you can move, the more you, you stay physically active, the better it will be for your health. And we can see successful aging was broadly defined. So we're not just talking about the physical body, but your brains as well. And I'm sure Zainer will touch more on that. But what's good for the body is good for the brain. So just to reiterate that, the benefits of regular activity, so it minimizes your risk of heart disease, stroke, and peripheral vascular disease. So remember, one of the most common causes of Death in Canada was cardiovascular disease, and the fifth was stroke. Diabetes, which will put you at increased risk for heart disease and stroke. Cognitive impairment, depression, so, so being active decreases your chance of becoming depressed. It's good for arthritis, and it also actually helps sleep. And I'm gonna talk specifically about sleep because as we age, people have more and more issues with sleep, and I'm gonna explain to you why. Now, I said I would come back to alcohol, so um, there is a lot of controversy in the literature, and it's been in the lay press a fair bit, so some of you may have seen some of these studies. So what we do know is that high consumption, and that's defined as more than three drinks a day, and that would be three drinks a day in, in, in men. Women, you probably have to consume a bit less because we know the effects on alcohol are a little stronger in women, so it would probably be more like less than two drinks a day in, in um, or sorry, more than two drinks a day in, in women, or if you're a binge drinker. So it's not also not good to go Monday to Friday not drinking and then drinking um, large amounts on the weekends. That's also not healthy. They're all associated with adverse outcomes. So alcoholism, motor vehicle accidents, and other trauma, liver disease, cardiac disease, dementia, so um, excessive alcohol will um, result in a form of dementia, cancer as well, and then other causes of, de of death. Moderate, with, for moderate consumption, the data is mixed. Some studies suggest it's okay, some studies suggest not. What seems to be um, clear, though, is that lighter consumption, so I mean one to three drinks per week, is probably somewhat protective in terms of cardiovascular cancer, but beyond that, the protective benefits are probably lost. So what about other things? So lots of people like to take vitamins. They think it's good for their health. So what does the evidence suggest? So if we look at chronic disease prevention, for multivitamins, there's no evidence of benefit in a general population. So there's certain groups, certain populations, and the fa your family doctor will inform you if you happen to be in one of those populations where you need to be on a vitamin. But for the most part, paying for a multivitamin and taking it every day is really of no value, assuming that you're eating a balanced and healthy diet. So that's really the key. And you, actually, you get your nutrients better if you take it through diet than if you take it from a pill. And additionally, in Canada, we fortify a lot of our food. So if you're eating a well-balanced diet, and the Canadian food guide has changed to some degree, but um, basically if you eat particularly, say, a Mediterranean-style diet or a diet that's rich in... Um, uh, omega acids and you know don't need the omega acid supplements but that sort of diet that the Mediterranean is, is very healthy so eat healthy you don't need to take a multivitamin the exception would be for bone health particularly for women so we recommend did, um, for your bone health that we all need vitamin D and in Canada we know that we're deficient we don't get outside enough we don't get enough Sun for the most part so most people are, will be deficient so the recommendation is 1,000 to 2,000 international units per day. So if you don't have osteoporosis, 1,000 is probably sufficient. If you know you have osteoporosis, you should be taking 2,000 international units a day. Um, so it depends on, on your risk for osteoporosis, how much you take. As far as calcium, though, we recommend you take it in your diet. So the recommendation now is 1,200 
uh, milligrams of elemental calcium and better consumed in your food and not in pills. There's some studies that suggest when you take it as a pill, what happens is you take this big load of calcium and what happens is when it gets into the bloodstream, it probably sort of what we call precipitates or goes out into the vessels and actually can increase your risk of heart disease. So we don't recommend that people take a lot of um, pill supplements or calcium, no more than one um, pill of calcium a day, ideally dairy. And what, how much is 1,200? Well, if you, every serving of dairy is about 300. So if you have a yogurt and a serving of cheese and a couple glasses of milk, you've got your four servings and you're good for your, for your, for your dairy. Other issues as we age, so hearing loss with aging is very common. And what happens in, as a normal part of aging is we lose high frequency sounds as we age. So words such as S's. And for those of you wives in the room, it, your husbands really can't hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Women's voices get harder to hear because our voices are higher pitched than men's voices. The other thing to remember is when you yell or you talk louder, you actually increase the pitch. So you make it even harder to hear. So the ideal, if someone's hard of hearing, you ideally want to talk a little bit louder, but try to talk deeper. Um, and that will help them to hear. The issue with hearing is it really impacts your ability to communicate. You miss what's being said. And so it can impact your quality of life and also can result in mental health problems. So really going and see an audiologist if, if you're suspected um, that you have hearing problems is recommended. And there's good evidence that bilateral hearing aids is cost effective and is recommended. It'll improve your quality of life and decrease your risk of m mental health problems. So what about eyes and aging? So what happens as we age? There's a normal part of aging which is called presbyopia. So that's basically where your arms become too short. So basically, it's difficulty with your vision, your near vision. Um, so, you, so it gets harder to, to read, in particular, um, which may mean you have to go to the, the drugstore and get your cheater readers, um, or, or end up with the bifocal glasses if you already had problems with your distance vision in the past. The other thing that happens with aging is we tend to accumulate more diseases. So as I said, um, as we get older, we, our risk of frailty, which is associated with chronic diseases, goes up. And so you, there is diseases that are more common as we age. So they're not normal processes of aging, but they're more common. So, for gl so glaucoma, so that's basically the elevated pressures in your eyes that can, that can damage your optic nerve, so it can damage your vision. And the scary thing about glaucoma is you usually don't have symptoms until it's too late. So the recommendation is that you re go regularly when, it's actually the, the incidence of glaucoma or the occurrence of glaucoma starts going up quite dramatically after the age of 40. So you really should be going and getting your eyes checked at least every couple of years if you um, have otherwise healthy vision just to pick up the glaucoma early, because it's treatable. If we pick it up early before you have damage, it's treatable. Macro degeneration is also very common, and that's where the center part of your vision, that you start losing that. So you can see everything in the periphery, you can't see what's right in front of you. So it can be very disabling. There are some newer treatments for it. We don't fully understand what causes it, but it becomes more common as we age. We think it might be somewhat related to sun exposure. Really important you wear sunglasses, um, and the children wear sunglasses. We should be wearing protective, proper sunglasses um, whenever we're out in the sun, even in the winter. Cataracts are also common. The lucky thing about cataracts is that it has become such a great, um, easily treatment. You go in, I think most people are in and out within an hour. When I was a resident, people were actually got admitted because I remember having to cover at night for the ophthalmologist for their cataract patients. Now nobody's ever admitted for cataract. It's not even in an acute care setting. So easily treatable. Even if you're frail and have some health issues, you're probably a candidate for cataracts because it's such a minor procedure now. And then, as I said, diabetes um, is one of the major um, contributing issues with uh, our health and, and as, as um, the prevalence of diabetes is going up in society and then there's risks. Um, diabetes doesn't only impact your heart, it can also impact your vision. So basically, as we get older, the recommendation is regular eye exam. So every one to two years, depending on you and, and on the diseases you have and, and the recommendations of your eye doctors. But if you haven't had your vision checked within the last couple years, I would recommend you go and have it checked. And have, they will check for glaucoma, and they will check for other evidence of, of eye disease. This is a very common issue. And um, I've given this talk to other groups, and I didn't include this initially. And that was all the questions I got was, how come I can't sleep? So I, now I'm going to tell you all about sleep and the problems with, with sleep. So the issue with sleep, um, 
as we, as we age, sleep becomes a bigger problem. And it has to do with more what happens as we age. We change in our sleep patterns. So unfortunately, as you get older, you spend less time in that deep restorative sleep, you know, that sleep where you really can't wake up. Uh, I don't know how many of you have small children in your life, but children spend a lot of time in deep sleep. And deep sleep is when you grow. Teenagers, too, are a good example. Teenagers need a lot of sleep. They're spending in deep sleep. They're growing. Once you're past your growth by age, so once you're into your 20s, you're no longer growing, your sleep, the amount of sleep you need doesn't, doesn't change the, through the rest of your life. Most people will still only need seven to eight hours. So as we age, we don't need more sleep. Unfortunately, what's happening though is because you're spending less time in that nice deep restorative sleep, you're spending more time in light sleep, which means your sleep feels sometimes less restorative because you're waking up more. Um, you can, you, your sleep can be disturbed by more minor noises that maybe didn't wake you up before. And then also as we age, we produce more urine at night, so you have to get up to go to the bathroom, or you're, you have pain, become arthritis, so then it hurts when you roll over, or, or, or you're, you know, you're a snorer, or if you're unfortunate enough, your spouse snores, and then all those sorts of things, right, can impact um, your sleep. So the best thing to do, actually, for sleep is it's not medication, it's lifestyle things. So establish a nighttime routine. So similar to what we do with, with small children, um, go back to that nighttime routine that, that you did when you were a child, which means trying to go to bed around the same time every night, but not too early. So I often have patients that will come in and say, you know what, I'm waking up at three o'clock in the morning, I can't figure out why, and then I say, well, when do you go to bed? Oh, seven or eight. Well, you've had your seven, eight hours, you're up, gonna be up at three. So you don't need to go to bed that early. Um, so, and also, the other thing too is be, be conscious of how much you're napping during the day. So if you take an hour nap, that means you no longer need that seven or eight hours at night, you've just cut it down by an hour. So it's, it's that seven or eight over the whole 24 hour period. I mentioned that as we get older, we produce more urine at night for multiple reasons. So go to the bathroom, even if you don't feel like it before you have to go to bed, that may help with your sleep. Trying things like relaxing music or white noise machines, depending on how you, how you are. Don't get on a computer and try to avoid TV. The computers are the worst though because that screen is actually activating, so it'll actually wake you up. I tell my husband this every night, he's not a good sleeper, and I wake up and he's sitting on his computer in bed, but doesn't listen to me, but listen to me, it's, that's not a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if you know you have arthritis and you know you, pain's an issue, consider if you, know, if you don't have a contraindication, take a pain medication. The safest is Tylenol or acetaminophen, it may help your sleep. And then trying as much as possible for a dark, quiet bedroom, as much as you can. If those don't work, some other things to try is you can try some warm milk at bedtime. Doesn't need to be much. What happens when you warm milk is it releases tryptophan, which is a nice natural sleep aid. And you actually can't buy tryptophan over the counter because a few years ago there was a bad batch that um, resulted in some deaths, so that it's not actually now commonly available. But you can take it in warm milk. It's also the thing that released in, in Turkey. So why we feel tired after we have a, a nice turkey dinner? There's a lot of tryptophan. <laughs> Avoid sleeping pills, and this includes over-the-counter. Over-the-counter sleeping pills are actually worse even than the ones your doctors are gonna give you. So what an over-the-counter sleeping pill is, so that the NyQuil's and the Tylenol PM, what they have done is they've taken one of the older generation of antihistamines. I don't know how many of you have allergies, but I remember as a kid, you take an antihistamine and you'd be zonked. It's that older than, you know, the one before they had the non-drowsy. It's that older formulation, and they've thrown it now into these sleep aids, and they're using that side effect of the antihistamine. So it's really not good for you. Not good for your cognition, not good for you. It does, will not help your sleep. So don't take those over-the-counter ones. Just because it's over-the-counter doesn't mean it's safe. And then the sleeping pills prescribed are really meant for short term. So they're meant for when you have you know, an acute event in your life and you really have problems sleeping and you just need a good couple days sleep. They really shouldn't be taken more than a few days because you can quickly develop dependency and they don't actually improve your sleep. You maybe spend 20 minutes more of sleeping and your sleep is less restorative. So you're gonna spend more time in that light sleep. So I don't recommend um, sleeping pills at all. And I, we spend a lot of time as geriatricians actually stopping them. They're one of the most commonly prescribed medications in Alberta, and they shouldn't be. So don't, don't stop them suddenly if you're taking them. Go see your doctor, because you need to titrate off them. Um, but um, really sh something to reconsider if you're taking them already, and don't ask for them um, uh, if, if you're, you were thinking of it. Some other things you can try is try physical activity a couple hours before bed. So particularly in this day and age, or this sort of when we can, now we don't have winter, you can get outside, is go for a walk after dinner. Um, what it does is it brings up your body core temperature and then it'll, your core temperature slowly cools down and that mimics the normal process as we sleep. Our core temperature tends to cool down a bit so it mimics that normal tendency so it'll help you sleep. Don't do it right before bed because now you've warmed up your core and your body's not ready for sleep so it's a couple hours before bed. 
You can also try a warm bath, the same thing, um, does the same thing, warms up your core, and then your core slowly um, will, will cool down, mimicking sleep. But once again, don't do it right before bed, do it an hour before bed. Avoid caffeinated beverages, particularly um, any sort of, I, I typically recommend don't take any coffee or regular teas sort of after, say, two in the afternoon, or definitely not after, after um, sort of five at night. That will definitely impact your sleep. Try not to drink a lot of fluids at night um, to try to minimize that need to get up. And then, as I've already mentioned, watch the daytime naps. If you really want a nap, that's okay, but keep it to 20 to 30 minutes. Now, I said I wanted to touch on advanced care planning. So how many in the room have, have an advanced, um, advanced care plan or have a personal directive or power of attorney? So a few people? Okay. So basically what advanced care planning is, it's a way we think about and talk about and document the care we want in the event that we are no longer able to actually talk to our physician or our healthcare provider about what we'd want, or just in general to anyone else about what we want. And there's a, a really good website here if you're interested in, in how to actually think about this and have conversations. Advanced care um, planning is so the overall plan, so having that discussion. It's not just a document, it's a dialogue. Subsets of advanced care planning are something called a personal directive and an enduring power of attorney. Now, a personal directive, there, it's a legal document, and it, though, speaks to your health decisions and your personal um, decisions, so where you're going to live. And typically, it, it'll, can, if it, a well-done one will describe, kind of to some degree, what you would and would not want in terms of your um, health decisions, in terms of where you'd want to live. But m really importantly, it also assigns someone to make those decisions for you. So the key thing with a personal directive is to have the dialogue with the person you've assigned about the kind of thing so that they can make more informed decisions if you're not able to make them yourself. And you can actually do a personal directive without a lawyer. There's this, there's this website here uh, with, uh, in Alberta. You can print it off and you can have the discussions and appoint your s and, s and sign off on it. You don't need a lawyer. An enduring power of attorney is a legal document as well, and it's all about financial decisions. And it's in the event that you aren't capable, someone can manage your finances, which is also very important. Um, and this one you do require a lawyer. You can do your personal directive through a lawyer, but you don't need a lawyer. Very important as a healthcare provider, and I'm sure Eddie's had the same experience and probably Zayner, is we have lots of patients we see that have not done this, they're not capable, and it's not clear who is the best person to make that decision. We don't know you, we've just met you, we don't know if the person, the, who to go to, if the, that person would be the one you would choose. So something really to, to think about if you haven't already. We should all have them. Um, I had a very good friend that was in a bad motorcycle accident in his, in his 20s and was incapable for a period of time and didn't have one. And it was very hard on the family to figure out who was going to make these kinds of decisions for him. So it's, it's right across our lifespan as soon as we're 18 years of age. Goals of care is another concept that falls under advanced care planning. And that's really, it's, it's a medical order. And it's a way, it describes or communicates sort of a general aim or focus of care. And I'm going to go through sort of in more detail what that means, but it's sort of around things like resuscitation and, and where you want your care, whether you want to be in an ICU or acute care or maybe not either. And actually, in Alberta, Alberta is one of the best provinces for this. We have, there's been a lot of work done around advanced care planning and around school goals of care. We have some of the best um, uh, design goals of care, and other provinces are actually learning from what we've done and are, and are mimicking ours. So what Alberta did several years ago is they've separated goals of care into three main categories. So have any of you had a discussion of your goals of care with your family doctor or with another care provider? Oh, maybe one or two? Okay. So this is available in, pu in the public domain, and it breaks, breaks, basically breaks down um, care into three main categories. So there's resuscitative care, medical care, and comfort care. Resuscitative care is where all appropriate medical tests and interventions, including ICU and resuscitation, would be done. So you include, you, if you decide the R-level care, that's what they would do. If you get into a care setting, you can't make the decision for yourself. Everything will be done right up to in an ICU and, and, all, and um, all forms of resuscitation. Medical care is where they'll give appropriate medical tests and interventions, but you wouldn't get resuscitated if, if you were to go to cardiac arrest or go to an ICU, which it, sometimes when people, depending on your belief system and pretending, I would say, on your frailty, you know, um, you may choose not to go into ICU because we know that when people are frail, they don't do so well in the ICU. They tend to tend to be even decline even further, and they tend not to have good outcomes coming out of the ICU. So some people choose medical care only, which means you'd still get go to acute care, you'd still get aggressive care, but if, if, you know, if it meant that you had needed the care to the level of an ICU, you wouldn't go there. 
Comfort care is the care that really focuses on symptom management. So that's when people are very frail and at the end of life and decide that it's really around keeping quality of life and symptom management, and that's the comfort level care. So those are the three goals of care that you, that you can discuss with, with your family doctor and that we, we use commonly now within the healthcare system. And it helps direct, specifically in the healthcare setting, the kinds of care. And I said it, it what you choose somewhat depends on your belief system and also on your health status or your frailty and, and what, what's the likelihood that you would benefit from these various levels of care. So last thing I'm just going to touch on briefly is caregivers. So family caregivers are a really integral part of the healthcare system and I say they're not appropriately acknowledged. So we would not have a, the Canadian healthcare system without family caregivers. Um, Caregiving can be very stressful and can negatively impact the caregiver's health and well-being. It's also financially burdensome. So I'm not sure how many of you here are caregivers, but the recommendation I always say is, as a caregiver, you need to look after yourself. So it's a stressful, there are resources for you, but you need to, it's kind of like, um, you know, when you get on a plane and they say, put your oxygen mask on first and then help those around you. Think of caregiving the same way. You have to still take care of yourself in order to give good care and also to maintain your own, make sure you don't become frail and, and have health issues down the road. And for those of you that are caregivers, the government um, from a financial perspective does to provide some tax breaks. They aren't necessarily that open about this, but there's a website here and I'm happy to um, send um, these websites through, through Eddie if people want, want them. There's lots of resources, so you may not realize, but if you need home care supports, you don't need a referral from your family doctor or another health care provider. You can contact home care yourself and ask for home care supports. They can come in and they can give respite, they can help with, the, with care, they can help with things around the home. There's an organization called Caregivers Alberta, which is a good support. Um, the, a lot of the organizations like the Alzheimer's Society and the Dementia Network Calgary, although they focus on cognitive impairment, they have a lot of supports for caregivers. Um, and then um, within Calgary, we develop this online support system as well. It's a website and also an app for caregivers that helps you pay attention to your own health. So it, it sort of makes you think about, it gives you strategies to deal with dementia, um, issues related to dementia if you're caring for someone with dementia, but it also makes you pay attention to your own health. So I'm just going to wrap up with this last slide that basically the takeaway message, if you want, I covered a lot of things, but I would say the two things is stay physically active. Being physically active is going to increase your odds of successfully aging in addition to eating your fruits and vegetables like your mother probably told you and not smoking and watching your alcohol, but really physical, physical activity, really key. And then I would, I would strongly encourage everyone to engage in advanced care planning. Think about what would you want, who would you want to make decisions for you and what kind of decisions would you want them to make. So think about personal directives, powers of attorney, and, and your goals of care. Um, and a lot of these resources are available online. Or you can talk to your care, health care providers. So I think we're going to leave questions to the end. So I'll leave it for Zainer. Thanks very much. I'll try to find my talk here. Uh -oh. Aha. Okay. Once again, thank you very much uh, for having us, and it's a pleasure. Like there are about a hundred people here, so this is this is pretty remarkable, um, and obviously there's a lot of interest. Um, as, as mentioned, I'm Zainer Ismail. I'm a neuropsychiatrist at uh, the Hotchkiss Brain Institute, and my area of research is um, essentially the interface between cognition and behavior, um, looking at not only formal dementia and changes in, in neuropsychiatric status. Um, obviously, there's a lot of interest in this area, and, and so what I'm going to do is kind of summarize why we care about our brains so much, what we can do to optimize our health and our, and our brain function. Um, when we are concerned where we can go, what we can do, a sense of how we work it up clinically uh, in the hospital, and opportunities to participate in knowledge generation and research at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute. So cognition is very important to people because we have, society has changed in that once upon a time, the dawn of mankind, it was our brawn that determined for the most part our strength, how successful we were. Nowadays, it's how many passwords you can remember and your login codes and, and the cognitive burden on even the most simple tasks and jobs is really great. I, um, I had a lovely patient 
who um, had childhood meningitis and some subtle cognitive deficit from that, but worked as a personal care aide and did a remarkable job with her patients and provided great care. And then when they introduced um, computers and technology into the workplace and she had to do computerized tracking, all of a sudden her exemplary work record went down the tubes, not because of any difference in how she performed caring for her patients, but in how she managed to log on to computers and track and all those things which were challenging for her. So the need for us to be alert and attentive and remember things in the modern world is, is, is much different from how it was once upon a time. Depending on people's age, they have preconceived notions of what happens when they have some sort of cognitive deficits. If people are young, they believe they have ADHD, and if people are in midlife um, and older, they start worrying that they have Alzheimer's or other types of dementia. As a sort of primer, dementia is an umbrella term, and it's a clinical diagnosis based on a decline in cognition that's associated with a decline in function. Now, based on the type of symptoms we have, we will diagnose it as a different type of dementia or another. The most common type of dementia is Alzheimer's, but there are vascular dementias and Lewy body and frontotemporal. I saw someone this morning in clinic with a uh, primary progressive aphasia, which is a kind of a language variant uh, dementia. So there are many different types, um, and we make those diagnoses clinically, but what we've found is that, you know, about 20, 25% of the time, we're wrong. The clinical symptoms don't really give us a good picture. We've thus developed a brain bank at the uh, Foothills, the Hotchkiss Brain Institute, whereby if people, upon passing, want to really know the details of their loved one's cognitive status and, and dementia, we can provide a very, very specific um, uh, dementia autopsy, which is v different from... Um, you know, donating your, your brain to the medical school or to, you know, f for, for anatomy labs or organ donation. This is very sp different. This is sp specific detailed brain analysis, and that's something new that we've developed over the last few years at the Hotchkiss Brain Institute because there is a great need for that. Um, again, people want to know upon their loved one's passing what really was the story, given that we are sometimes not accurate based on the clinical presentation. We do make these diagnoses based on where in the brain there are changes. Sometimes we see this on imaging. We take an MRI um, or a PET scan or a CT scan, but sometimes even that's not helpful. Now, when we think about dementia, we really think about cognition. We think about memory, um, and which is one of the fundamental symptoms. But Dementia is more than just cognitive symptoms. It's safety. And when we do dementia assessments, we look at safety. Fires, floods, accidents, hazards, falls, driving. We look at changes in motor function and sensory function, and very importantly, changes in behavior. We call these neuropsychiatric symptoms, and they are now, in the diagnostic criteria, considered core features. I categorize them as follows. Changes in... Okay. Changes in, in drive or motivation, which we describe as apathy. Sometimes people get disinhibited or easily frustrated or a little bit agitated. Um, and and we, we describe that as that sort of impulse discontrol domain. People can have changes in their, in their mood regulation and the emergence of anxiety symptoms in the context of dementia. They can start losing their filter a little bit, and they become a little bit more disinhibited. The inside voice becomes the outside voice, and then people can become suspicious or even see and hear things that aren't there. These are very important symptoms, and as I mentioned, they are a core feature of dementia and associated with a great burden on family and, for, and caregivers. Um, we call them neuropsychiatric symptoms, and if you take two groups of people with dementia, and to divide them up based on whether or not they have neuropsychiatric symptoms. Those who do have any of these symptoms have a greater degree of caregiver burden. They're more functionally impaired. They are institutionalized at a higher rate. Their quality of life is poorer. They actually decline more quickly. And um, upon passing, when they do autopsies on these people, they actually have more of the abnormal proteins of dementia in their brain. So when you, when you have someone with these behavioral symptoms, it means they have a worse version of the illness. 
in my sort of long-term care and or, you know seniors residence population the bulk of my consults are really for people who have these types of behaviors it results you know someone might hit someone else or they might grab or they might rummage or to and they might throw things they might try pound on the door to escape and these are very distressing the question is how do we manage them um, there is a lot of debate and controversy in this field um, recent work by colleagues at the University of Calgary have showed that the non-pharmacological um, approaches, you know, relaxation therapy, Montessori therapy, aromatherapy, all of these are helpful to a certain extent, but the research is flawed to a certain extent because the way we measure agitation and dementia is grossly flawed. The FDA, the, F the, the Food and Drug Administration in the U.S. said that they would not approve uh, a drug for agitation and dementia until there was a better definition, one that was grounded in science. So in fact, in recent years then, uh, a group of colleagues uh, developed that definition and the ag agitation in, in de uh, dementia is now categorized into three domains that result in distress to the person with dementia. And those domains include physical aggression, which we typically think of, but also verbal aggression is a separate domain, and purposeless or excessive motor activity. And um, if, if someone has symptoms in any of those three domains and they're distressed, then that counts. And now there are intervention trials and a higher bar and specificity and measurement that will improve how we move forward. Historically, psychiatric meds were used, antipsychotics transferred or transposed from their use uh, in agitation in, in schizophrenia, for example. Um, used in this older population and, and it was assumed that they were just as effective and reasonably safe and it turned out that they aren't. And so antipsychotics are by no means a first line and they are now kind of a last choice for agitation and dementia. But that change and that transition has only been happening in the last few years. We actually studied this and we, uh, we did a large study funded by the U.S. Uh, National Institute of Aging, the federal government. Um, whereby we showed a simple garden variety antidepressant was as effective as a big major antipsychotic. We published this in JAMA and we changed the field because now it became very clear and evidence-based that we have safer initial alternatives. But even then the science has to advance and now we, and we found in analyses of those studies that that simple garden variety antidepressant is also not benign and then there's a newer version of that which when we did some sub-analyses would determined to be safer and better. So we are now redoing that trial, also funded by the U.S. federal government, right here in Calgary is one of the sites. And we are looking at, at um, using this uh, antidepressant for managing these agitated behaviors in Alzheimer's. It's called the SCTAD study. So by the way, um, I have sign-up sheets for those of you who are interested in any of our research programs. I'm, I'm talking about a few of them, like the Brain Bank, like the SCTAD study. I have uh, sign-up sheets back there on the table and also on this handy clipboard here, which I will pass around after. Um, if you want to discuss any of this further with us, if you give us your information, we're happy to call and screen and determine, uh, you know, if, if and for what you are suitable. Because I think it's really important that in this area that is so important to people, that, that um, families and patients have the opportunity to participate in cutting edge knowledge. We also have a clinical trial program, for example, for investigational drugs for cognition. So for mild cognitive impairment for early stage Alzheimer's, we have a clinical trial program um, and we recruit from all over the province uh, for that, for the newest and latest. And we're still trying to find that breakthrough drug for Alzheimer's. So for those who are interested, by the way, if you don't want to leave your name, I have this very handy and easy to remember email, brainresearch at ucalgary.ca. And, and, uh, and you may have heard some of our radio ads because I have a radio ad going on too right now. Uh, you know, as we really try to, to broaden our scope uh, in attracting people to, to participate in, again, knowledge generation. Now, this is a, a very important woman. Her name is Auguste D. And her case was published by Alois Alzheimer 112 years ago. She was the first patient really described systematically with what we now call Alzheimer's dementia, Alzheimer's disease. And his name, Alois Alzheimer, is the, home, is, you know, the, the, the illness carries his name. And we think of Alzheimer's as a disease of memory. Right? What's important, though, 
is that she, Auguste D, was actually hospitalized for delusions. She, she became suspicious, she became emotionally dysregulated, was admitted to hospital, and declined cognitively thereafter, and yet had the hallmark index case of dementia. We forgot this message, however, and we were so focused for the next hundred years on memory and dementia, we forgot about the behavioral manifestations. Why is this important? Over 100 dementia clinical trials have failed. Just two weeks ago, we got uh, a, an email that the ENGAGE study by Biogen, a really large study, um, was stopped early for because of a futility analysis. It looked like it wasn't going to work, so they pulled the pin early on this trial. I saw a patient that very day who was doing really well, it seemed, and was um, had been moved to the open label extension arm. But what happens is that we don't have good criteria to select who will respond to these investigational drugs and who won't. And when there's a lot of sort of noise, and when there are people who are not going to respond put into the trials, then all of a sudden the trials failed and billions of dollars have been have been lost uh, and 20 years um, still looking for that breakthrough Alzheimer's drug. When you read every one of those 100 trials, they say the same thing. There's poor recruitment and retention in early phase illness. Now, how do we detect early phase illness? Because we've been preoccupied with cognition and memory, we wait for people to have memory impairment and we say, aha, then you have Alzheimer's. Well, you know what? Might be too late. And what the data tells us is that the changes in your brain start 15, 20 years before you have symptoms, memory symptoms. So you're kind of chasing your tail if you're waiting for memory changes to capture this illness early. Bear in mind that 112 years ago, the first patient with Alzheimer's dementia documented, you know, of course it's been around for a lot longer than that, presented with changes in behavior, in personality, in neuropsychiatric symptoms. So we went back to the drawing board and said, hey, can we revisit this? Can we look at it a different way so that we can potentially capture people before they have changes in cognition? And, we, and, and that is based in a whole lot of experience and, um, and a lot of literature. So when you, this is a really nice study from a group in San Francisco, Bruce Miller's group, and, uh, and they went to all of their patients in clinic who had dementia, and they went back in their charts. And what they found was that 28% of them were actually initially given a psychiatric diagnosis, just like Auguste D, admitted to the hospital 112 years ago. Often, dementia presents with psychiatric symptoms, and yet neurologists have, have kind of dismissed the neuropsychiatric symptoms as psychiatric illness or the worried well and they were just kind of you know no this isn't dementia and then you know they would wait for the changes in memory and cognition so we set to together a group um, of international colleagues to really explore this and i led this team and we developed a, the criteria for a syndrome which has since been validated called mild behavioral impairment and the hallmark of this is when people over the age of 50, develop for the very first time a change in neuropsychiatric status that can't be accounted for by another formal psychiatric illness. It's not a recurrence of a past illness. This is a new onset of symptomatology in mid and later life. And what we found in, in, with the syndrome is, and I just, published, I just uh, submitted an abstract today based on a recent analysis with this. When, when people develop mild behavioral impairment, they have a much higher likelihood of developing uh, mild cognitive impairment early and pre-dementia and dementia than those who don't have it. When we do fancy biomarker studies, you can take a group of people uh, with normal cognition and we give them a rating scale for this, which I also developed. Um, and if they score high on the rating scale, they are much more likely to have Alzheimer's proteins without any cognitive changes. So we have a way of capturing very early a potential risk for cognitive decline and dementia. And we are doing studies right now um, across the world. We have about 17 studies going, uh, uh, validating and looking at the biomarker correlates and the trajectories um, of mild behavioral impairment. Um, and the primary one is right here in Calgary. And, and so we're always looking for people to participate in that. And I'll tell you more, more about that. When people come to clinic though, we look at everything. We look at cognition, we look at behavior, we look at function. Very importantly, we test the person who's suffering from these symptoms, but we ensure that we talk to their family members because a 
profoundly underappreciated, as, as Dr. Holroyd Leduc said, and very important group are the family members. They see things that uh, perhaps someone might not see themselves, and they can provide an external input. So we have to and, and, and have some other source of information. I would not put my name to a consult um, if I don't have external input because all I'm doing is taking someone's word for whatever's going on. And while they might be very valid and I can get some decent testing, when it comes to the other issues around safety and function, I want, you know, I want extra input. So we do a very detailed history, not only of cognition, but also of neuropsychiatric status. We look at trajectories, which came first, how did it progress? We measure, as I mentioned, and of course, we rule out reversible medical causes. Dr. Hallred Leduc talked about sleeping medications. The first thing uh, we look at is their medication list and are they taking medicines, whether prescribed or over the counter, that can impair their cognition. I've seen people who have discovered the over the counter sleep medications which have Benadryl in them or those older antihistamines and they knock you out. But what they do is they impair your cognition well into the next day. And I've had a number of patients where we just cut out the antihistamine and all of a sudden they're thinking more clearly again. So you're not going to give that person a dementia diagnosis or a pre-dementia diagnosis until you make sure that all of this other stuff is, is really addressed. We work them up with laboratory investigations. We uh, do a neurological exam. The younger they are, the more likely are we are to do f more fancy uh, I investigations. I saw someone in clinic today who was 60 with, you know, some pretty significant changes, but another a whole host of other medical comorbidities. And she's someone who I will bring back to clinic and I will put a needle in her back and, and do a, a spinal tap to, to draw for biomarkers and fluids because she is young and we have to really work harder to rule things out. So depending on where you are in the lifespan, the, the type of investigations change. Now, people want to know, and we, you know, patients ask this all the time, what can we do to optimize our cognition and prevent cognitive decline? And then we have a whole sort of, um, you know, module, and I'll give an educational module either then or I bring them back, and we talk about all the different things. Now, first and foremost, Dr. Holroyd Leduc has talked about exercise, and we know exercise works from a number of ways. We've always knew, we've always known that exercise works by by um, improving your vasculature and the blood flow, you know, keeping your, your, your pipes clean and running well, but it's much beyond that. Um, exercise decreases inflammation, and inflammation is a really unfortunate consequence of our modern world. We have a more inflammatory environment and diet than we ever have in the history of mankind, and it's taking our uh, its toll on our bodies and our brains and how they're connected. Um, your brain loves the gym for, 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 for many reasons. Um, it releases endorphins, norepinephrine. When you exercise, it, it, your brain then produces a chem chemical called BDNF, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which helps neurons connect and grow and talk. And, and there are many reasons why exercise can help. One thing that is new that we're starting to realize is that exercise changes the bacterial content of your bowel. So we've, we, the, the gut biome, the, the, the trillions of bacteria that live in our intestines are um, very important. We evolved with those bacteria. When we cluster bomb our bacteria with antibiotics, we have to start from scratch. We lose some important s strains. Sh food that we eat can adversely affect our gut biome. Inflammation can adversely affect our gut biome. Exercise reduces that loss, and it results in increased diversity in our gut biome. So it's a it's a, a growing area of research. Maybe Dr. Kaplan talked to you a little bit about that um, when he was here. Diet is a big part of it. Dr. Hallward talked about the Mediterranean diet, and when you look in the literature and in science, and when you want to compare um, a Mediterranean diet to a bad diet, they actually call it the Western diet in science. And you can look, at, so I gave a, a few years back a talk to the Alzheimer's Society and a community information um, forum. And, and Tim, and I actually put this slide up, and Tim Hortons had sponsored them, and they were sort of <laughs> donuts all along the back. And, and, you know, I know they were a sponsor, and I felt, I felt torn. Do I say something or do I not? In the end, I, I had, I had to say something. I said, you know, I, we're thankful for sponsors, et cetera, all that. But you know what? That stuff is poison. And um, 
So there weren't donuts next year, and people may not like me for that. But one of the biggest issues is refined and added sugar. So the sugar industry is nefarious and notorious and taught the tobacco industry how to befuddle science and lawyers and to trick us into consuming their product. Again, we know how bad the tobacco industry is. They learned their tricks from the sugar industry. There are about 49 different ways in which sugar is labeled. So if you don't want sugar to rise to the number one ingredient in your food, you put a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. And all of a sudden, you know, you've got nine different sugars in your packaged product, but people don't notice because of all the fancy names and, you know, starch is the number one. What you find is that um, the more sugars you have, the worse it is for your inflammation and your, your body reacts by changing your gut biome so the bacteria the healthy bacteria they don't appreciate it and they perish um, which then contributes to further illness and further cognitive decline and further neuropsychiatric symptoms it's all all connected so what I tell my patients if you can do one thing try to start eating more natural veggies consistent with Dr. Hallroy Duke said and if you just start eating more raw green leafies and veggies every day you will decrease the amount of refined sugars. Now you think, oh, well, I'll use stevia. Well, hmm, the, 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 the best group in the world studying this actually is, is, is from Israel, and they published a landmark study that showed when you, um, when you uh, ingest fake sugars, you know, the sugar substitutes, it's actually no better for you. Uh, you know, that's always the case, isn't it? We try to fool Mother Nature and we, we, it doesn't work out. Um, it still affects your gut biome and your body tastes sweet but doesn't have a blood sugar rise. Your body says, just in case, I'm going to start pumping out insulin. So it contributes to diabetes and insulin resistance. So, you know, you can't, you can't win when you have a sweet tooth. Like you just, you know, it's tough. You just got to work at it. Being social is very, very important. You know, if when you're social, when you're in a group, you talk, you then someone responds and you listen. You use the receptive part of your brain, you farm out to all of your, the rest of your brain to get memories, you send them back to the expressive part of your brain, you formulate words, you respond, you listen, you look for nonverbal cues, you look at the other person, people disagree, you're looking for emotion, your whole brain is active when you're in a social environment. Um, seeing it at home alone in front of a screen is the opposite of that. And data is starting to show that the more socially active you are, the slower your incidence of cognitive decline. Now that's a little bit controversial because a symptom of increased, more rapid cognitive decline is apathy. So if you have apathy, you're less likely to be social. So is the fact that increased social activity is associated with decreased decline, is it because people are more social or because they're not apathetic? It's, you know, two sides of the coin. That story has yet to be resolved, and can we do something about it? A large group of colleagues around the world are looking at this notion of apathy, you know, that being, and apathy is actually broken down into three constructs, emotional apathy, so um, behavioral apathy, and, and, and cognitive apathy, for another day. People try, people try to then, you know, stimulate their brain, and perhaps they'll sign up for, um, lumosity, right? And um, the evidence suggests, yeah, lumosity was, by the way, fined by the FDA for, for false advertising because they didn't have control groups in their studies. And what they find is that there are actually placebo responses in cognition to computerized cognitive testing. So their data was all suspect. Um, there is little evidence that your sort of garden variety computerized cognitive testing improves your thinking um, or is generalizable to the real world. So what I suggest is people do natural free things, crosswords, Sudoku, you know, bridge, mahjong, things that they can do in groups where they talk and they're social, right? You don't want to just be in front of your screen or your device thinking that that's going to help your cognition. It, it might, but what we just, we don't know that for sure. And there are better, better ways. So when we look at modifiable risk factors, and I talk to patients about this, of course, there are those that increase your risk and a lot of new research on hypertension, for example, um, sleep disturbance, um, as, as Dr. Hallard uh, suggested, um, that 
physical activity, Mediterranean diet, cognitive training, the alcohol literature, again, a little bit controversial, social engagement still needs more work, years of formal education. I gave a talk to my kids' school, and I'm surprised they asked, you know, they brought in uh, Adele Diamond, who's a neuropsychologist, um, to talk, you know, it's a Montessori school, about executive function in kids, and then they asked me to speak at their annual conference. And I said, okay. So I, I, the name of my talk was uh, Dementia Prevention Starts in Childhood, the Role of a Montessori Education, and it's actually true. It's actually true. The more robust an early education, the more multimodality, um, the, the, the greater the backup systems. What else helps? Bilingualism. Right? So here we are in Alberta, where some people sometimes feel that you don't need a second language. Well, your brain, there's a really nice study out of India that, that looked at the average age of people coming in with mild cognitive impairment to a memory clinic, and the average age for those who are bilingual was seven years older than those who are unilingual. So you had seven more years before you presented to clinic if you were, if you were um, uh, bilingual. So again, all these sorts of things start, this cognitive reserve starts building early. There are studies that show that when, irrespective of your occupation, if you're in a decision-making job where you're managing people or you're really making a lot of decisions, it actually promotes longevity in terms of healthy brain aging. So using your brain and not poisoning it with, with sugar and processed foods, the Western diet, is the best step, but we need more research. So I'll end with that. We have a lot of, uh, the, the Hotchkiss Brain Institute is really ramping up um, its activity in healthy brain aging. I'm part of the Ron and Reen Ward Center for Healthy Brain Aging, or we call it the Healthy Brain Aging Labs, and we have all sorts of studies looking at different ways that we can identify people early, find risk factors that we can modify, address those risk factors. So we have studies for people with no cognitive symptoms, with mild cognitive symptoms, and with formal cognitive symptoms and dementia. We take all comers. We can probably find a study for every single person. Um, and, uh, you know, and if we can't, then we'll find someone who can, right? Um, so for those of you, and, and, and the way I describe it with my patients, sometimes there's a clear benefit. Hey, there's this medication. If you've got Alzheimer's um, and you have some distress and disinhibition and some agitation and frustration, yes, we have a study. We can help you immediate, like a treatment. Um, on the other hand, when I'm doing lumbar punctures, you know, which is a pretty invasive technique to, to kind of make a diagnosis, we ask people if we can take one extra at one extra tube of fluid, because we're taking five anyway, um, because one of our colleagues has developed a blood test he thinks can help diagnose Alzheimer's, but we need to compare it to the, to the um, cerebrospinal fluid. So no matter where, where you are in your stage of mid and later life, we, you know, the HBI can find a way to uh, allow people to participate for their own um, benefit and for altruism, for the benefit of the next generation of people who might suffer from these illnesses. So if you are interested, again, there are sign-up sheets over there, um, and I'll pass another one around here, and I thank you for your time. Wow, I told you we were in store for uh, two amazing speakers tonight, really internationally renowned scientists in uh, aging and in brain health, uh, how lucky we are. Uh, and uh, I understand, uh, based on Dr. Ismail's presentation, we are limiting macaroons to two <laughs> per person uh, tonight. So uh, I'm sure you've got lots of questions and we've got a good amount of time to address those. Uh, I would anybody like to get started with uh, a question for one of our panelists? Yes, I've, so I, I, I was, I used to watch the Phil Donahue show when I was growing up and I uh, just love walking around with the microphone. Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, how much is genetics, nature, sorry. Yeah, you just go a little closer. How much is genetics, nature versus nurture and our environment? In terms of uh, the brain aging? Everything. So how much is pre-programmed, whether it be neurological, cognitive decline, or frailty? I, I think generally speaking, um, so I'll, I'll leave the brain part of it. I think it depends on somewhat on the disease. So we know that there is certain um, diseases that there is a somewhat a genetic component. So um, 
you know, be things like diabetes tends to um, there tends to be a f uh, association family risk, you know, cardiac risk, cancer risk. So there is definitely a, a family factor, um, although that doesn't necessarily translate that that uh, you know your environment plays a key role as well. These a lot of um, the genetic diseases that we see, um, it's sometimes there is a clear cut. Um, one gene and you inherit it or you don't, but often it's actually an array of, of genes and, and it's the interaction between those genes and how you live. So the interaction between the genes and the environment. So just because you may have risk factors because you're family of a family history, you can somewhat modify a lot of that, a lot of the common diseases by your healthy lifestyle. So, you know, it, there's still value to staying active and, and, you know, trying to eat a healthy diet and, and doing those other healthy um, behaviors. Um, so for the most part, and, and actually as a geriatrician, you know, the, what I typically say is, is most people that I see have outlived the genetic issues, to be honest. Um. I, would, I, would, I would agree. Um, the 84-year-old person I saw in clinic today had no family history of dementia, and late-onset dementias tend to, be, to barely be heritable. There are too many other factors that can contribute. Early onset dementia, the 60-year-old I saw today had two family members on her mother's side who got dementia in um, their 50s. So uh, when someone's quite young, we, you know, and, and in, in my clinic, 60s quite young, um, I, I've had someone as, as young as 47 with Alzheimer's, which is extraordinarily rare. I've only had, in 20 years, three people under 50. Um, and in... The younger they are, the more the more we consider genetic causes, and it might be part of our workup. Um, what role does sleep apnea play in several of these diseases? Um, so sleep sleep itself is quite quite complicated, even aside sleep apnea. So just poor sleep. We do more and more literature is coming out. Just not having good sleep is actually negative for your health and negative negative overall. So whether or not you have sleep apnea, there seems to be, um, you know, the amount of sleep I is important for your physical and your cognitive health in general. Sleep apnea, we know it's related to, you know, higher levels of high blood pressure and increases your ris risk of, uh, of cardiac disease. There's probably does increase your risk of, um, of uh, you know, cognitive impairment, um, certain types of, of dementia. So it, so it is important to diagnose it and, and to treat it. Um, uh, it's more complex than just sort of the impact on sleep, but, but um, what's actually happening with sleep apnea is you're spending periods of time where you're not actually, you know, properly oxygenating your body because you're not breathing. <laughs> so. Great, and, and also we know that the connection between obesity as well, which, great. So back here we've got another question. I have a question about the honey. It's natural, and I know some people say, oh, it's just a honey, but my father eats it with the spoon. Yep. So I still think that honey, it's not the yeah. best. So it depends on the honey. Um, the honey we get in a bottle that we can sort of squirt in, it's, um, it's usually got added substances and added sugar to keep it liquid. But if it's, if it's honey that's really organic and natural without any added anything else, it's also then got all the other things that come in honey that are not sugar and the substances and the, the nutrients and everything else, I would suggest that that is a much, much better version. But, um, but not all honey is honey. And the more close it is to what you get from the hive, the better it is for you. And actually, just one thing about sugar. So like um, a lot of food we eat has natural sugars in it, particularly um, that, uh, fruits. Um, there was sort of been in some interesting literature around, you know, the crave, uh, the craze around um, smoothies, thinking that if we take a lot of fruit and we grind it up and put it into a smoothie, it's really healthy. And there's actually some studies that have shown that um, it, when you when you grind that fruit up into a smoothie, you, you're probably releasing that sugar. So now you've just basically consumed high levels of sugar that normally in the normal um, fruit is the sugars are trapped in the fibers and in the and so so eating the fruit itself in, in its normal normal um, sort of format. So if you eat the apple, you eat the grapes. You eat, so eat the, instead of grinding up that that fruit into a smoothie, eating the bowl of it as it is, it, you don't get that um, sort of quick release of sugars into the body, which actually you know isn't good for the system. That quick release of sugars increases your, you get the release of insulin, your increases your risk of, of actually um, potentially developing diabetes down the road, and it's just not, a big rush of sugar is not good. So even sort of natural um, types of sugar, it, basically by grinding it up into your blender, making it to drink, you almost change it into a refined 
a form of refined sugar. So try to be careful with, not that smoothies are all bad, but, but the, the good smoothie, if you talk to nutritionists, is about a very tiny amount of fruit and then a, some protein and um, you know, make, make, making the bulk of it are actually around protein and, and just liquid, like water or low-calorie li liquids. So something to think about and, and next time you go to have a fruit smoothie and is maybe just eat the fruit itself. And, and I'm seeing some whole mandarins on the table there, so that's good. A couple of questions. Uh, I really like the second speaker bringing in the notion of uh, social, the social milieu and how important that is. On the language acquisition, does it uh, matter at which age you learn? In other words, is it uh, you're talking elementary school or is it just as effective if you learn it in your 30s or 40s? Generally, the, the earlier you learn something, the longer it lasts. Um, but it's never too late to activate your brain and use, you know, so learning a language in the 30s and 40s is definitely going to make a difference. Um, I have patients who in their 70s decide they want to learn Spanish, and I commend them, and I think it's fantastic. Spanish is a really good one because I think it's probably the easiest language on the planet um, because the rules are consistent. It, it reads like it sounds. It hears like it's, it's read. Um, there are very few grammatical exceptions, so it's the one to go for if you really want to you know, learn a second language. And the second question has to do with music. Uh, you didn't touch on music, but is learning a musical instrument or listening even... Um, uh, worthwhile. Ab ab absolutely. In the same way that bilingualism Im Im improves cognitive reserve, so does f uh, musical fluency. Um, learning to read music is actually a mathematical process and enhances the, and it connects with the, the, the ability of the, 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 the brain to process math. Um, and then um, there are some really nice studies on piano that if you are expert at, at piano, you, you, develop an extra robustness in a certain part of your brain. Um, Albert Einstein was a violinist, and actually they, there's evidence that there's an extra little lobe, like sort of, you know, uh, um, based on expertise in that, in that instrument. Finally, there are some really interesting studies on jazz versus classical musicians and their ability to improvise and the way their brains operate. And... Um, the classical musicians had one type of brain activity, and the jazz musicians um, had an ability to lateralize and make connections that were really quite remarkable. So undoubtedly, m music and learning to play is good for your brain. Um, the other thing with music, and particularly they've done studies with children, looking at learning a musical instrument versus learning music on a computer, and it's actually different. So le learning the musical instrument seemed to develop brain pathways um, more rigorously than on a computer because it's not just about you know reading. It, you know, it's about reading the music. It's about the hand-eye coordination. You know, all, it's a it's a complex task, which is probably it's a complex cognitive task basically versus doing it on a computer. So it, it, learning the actual musical instrument. The other thing that we didn't really touch on is there is some evidence around. Um, music being effective in, in persons that have dementia, if you, it, when someone's feeling agitated or aggressive, if you play music they like, that sometimes actually is one of the, one of the behavioral interventions that seems to help in, in certain settings that can actually calm somebody down is, is music. So music is, is actually um, has, has lots of um, importance and helps you sleep too if it's the right music. Do you have a question back here? Is there one? Um, thank you for your presentation. Great brain teaser. Thank you. Um, the question that I have for you is that all this research that we have, how much do they influence governments for them to change policies in order to be able to avoid the cost of future having to take care of people? I know you mentioned a little bit of diet. Uh, I know that we have a new food guide, but my idea is just to ask you your influence towards organizations such as the governments. You know, I think I think it's mixed. I think the government was a big player in in some of the smoking. Um, you know, like changing the laws around smoking, which has been helpful. Um, you know, but then but then we turn around and we now have legalized marijuana, and I'm not sure how good that's going to be on our health, to be quite honest. Um, so I, th I think we do mix, and I don't think the government is necessarily always driven by by evidence. 
there is a whole group that is looking at so the type of research I do is much is called applied or knowledge translation research where we take sort of the studies that Zayner has has been doing and we try to apply it to real day-to-day -day practice of medicine and other health settings and there is a form of that of actually where we take its evidence-based policy so researchers are actually working on how can we communicate to the politicians in a way that that gives them the information that's evidence informed that will inform policy so we're trying you know to learn how to communicate with them but that being said, I, I think it's I think it's a mixed bag. I think sometimes um, policy is driven by other things, um, other you know. Uh, what it, it's too it's too complex. It's there's I've never been involved with any you know. We, we work with Alberta Health and other government agencies, and you know to varying degrees they implement the evidence, but it really has to do you know they they want to get elected, so it somewhat has to do with what popular media decides or the popular culture, right, or what, whatever it is, right. So. I, I personally, I think the whole marijuana thing is a great example of, of how um, r really it was it was an, a, a political agenda. It's, there's not, and it's now being oversold as this hugely. I don't know you guys had a talk on it, but and it's just my bias. But I don't. I think the evidence for it benefit really is being overstated, and there's a lot of potential from harm, from psychiatric illness, from cognitive issues. Um, you know, harm similar to what I the literature I showed you around alcohol. It, it's going to be very similar, I think, in the long run. Going into a room and forgetting what you went for. I do that all the time. You know, <laughs> same. I, I'll let Zayner give more details, but the thing about thinking about is is attention is very important. So when you're very when you're very busy and you have lots of things on the go you're not paying enough attention to, and so that's sometimes what happens. It's, it's, it, you, in order to remember something, you have to pay attention to put it into that memory bank. So I if you're overwhelmed or you have a medical condition that's affecting or you're on medications, so sleeping aids and other medications, alcohol that affect your attention, that can be what you're actually seeing. It's a problem with attention. It doesn't always mean you know, you're on the way to developing dementia. Yeah, I'm, I, I, exactly. I, I, before you you make a diagnosis of a memory issue, you have to ensure that people are able to attend and focus. And there are many reasons um, why that might be the case that have nothing to do with dementia. And sleep apnea has come up already, and that's actually a quite a common one. Um, people are not getting enough sleep at night, and so they're unfocused. Uh, and then the consequences of that are then they have other symptoms which may be misattributed, et cetera. So um, again, a good workup uh, on that attention is essential as part of the overall picture. I'd like to know what the connection is uh, between... Sorry? Closer. Closer. Oh, okay. I'd like to know the connection between people who wear hearing aids and dementia. I have read and I have heard that you are going to be more vulnerable for dementia if you don't hear and wear hearing aids. Okay, so the evidence is mixed in the area. Um, if people aren't hearing well, um, it can come off as them having memory impairment because they're just not processing the information. If people aren't hearing well, the brain can also be understimulated and they can wander off and then they become disengaged and that might be a risk factor as well. Conversely, some of the evidence suggests that um, when people are having central processing issues and there are subtle early signs of brain changes, it can appear that they're not hearing well when they're actually not processing signals well. So the first step is of course to get a good audiology assessment and uh, optimize any changes in hearing that are there, that are measurable, and then thereafter to do an appropriate assessment. We have a study going on um, where I'm collaborating with audiology, and we're looking at the, the, the interconnectedness of changes in behavior, hearing, and memory. And we've got some preliminary data in press right now, but it seems like the relationship is more complex than we once thought. You have many research uh, centers that are doing just what you're doing. You mentioned Israel. I understand. I read not that long ago that Israel is doing the same that you're doing, but they are within two years of treatment for uh, Alzheimer's and dementia. Can you tell me a little bit about that, please? I think there are a lot, you know, there are a lot of places that are on the verge, um, and, and they have been for some time. And that's the great disappointment in this field. I would hope and pray that they are, but I haven't really seen any 
good, compelling evidence that anyone is ahead of anyone else at this moment in, in terms of finding that, that breakthrough drug. Fingers crossed, we can hope. But the more people that are, that are looking at it, the better for us all. I have a question regarding daily routine and particularly in aging and staying in a work environment, uh, especially if you don't have a hobby. People that stay in work, I find, are more attentive, but that's a personal view. <laughs> I think what that speaks to is is your social interaction and your and your um, engaging in cognitive activities and and probably to some degree you know f physical activities as well. So whether that's you know doing um, you know recreational activities or whether it's doing it because it's a job that you want to continue, um, you know I, I think that that's what you, what you, what you're talking about is is just staying cognitively and physically active is important. Um, I'm going to it's a, take oh, sorry, just to add one more comment to that. It's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. Um, if you are in a very stressful environment, it was, and if work is very very stressful, it can over time that cumulative burden uh, adversely affect your health and your memory and your thinking. Um, on the other hand, some people find work, you know, th before they retire, very stressful because they're developing the subtle anxiety symptoms and cognitive changes that aren't really clearly diagnosed and it turns out to be you know resulting in work dysfunction so that's kind of the the, 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 the you know causing causing consequence i've seen many patients where they retire and then they kind of fall off a cliff cognitively right so the there is certainly evidence that applying an external motivator like reporting to a boss having to be somewhere on time does promote that routine and get you out of bed and keep you thinking and if you turn off your brain if you don't substitute as 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 jana said if you don't substitute and as you said a hobby or other activities or being social um, and then you're on your own that's probably not very pro-cognitive so it's a complex story um, the bottom line is that irrespective of of, of what you do being social, engaging your brain is, is essential. Yes. What about reading? It's a lone activity, but what does that say for your cognitive? So, well, you know, it depends a bit what you read. So it, it, it reading, I think, does a number of things. It improves your vocabulary. It improves your knowledge base. You know, it is an active... Um, Activity, so there, there is nothing, you know, it, reading is a, would be a good uh, um, activity. It's not as social, as you said, but it is, it um, can be, depending on what you're reading, can be somewhat intellectually um, challenging. Um, the interesting thing with often with early on, early onset um, co cognitive issues, early onset dementia, is people find challenging to read. So actually, um, that can also be a flag. Is that you know watching TV or, or reading can be challenging to follow. You can't follow because of the short term memory problems we see in a lot of dementias. So just sort of an interesting side that people often give up reading and even watching TV early on in in dementias. But but I, I think it yeah it's a it's a positive um, intellectual activity. Um, I think we'll have time for one more question. Thank you. I'm just wondering if there's been any studies done as to whether um, people who w we would call our ADD are more likely to develop dementia versus people who are what we would call linear, you know, thinkers. Is there any studies on that? It, um, <laughs> interesting, there are studies ongoing for that, and one of our colleagues um, at, at, the, uh, at the HBA is looking at adult uh, ADHD and, and, and dementia. Um, ADHD research is really hard because the diagnostic criteria require early evidence of cognitive, you know, of, of um, attentional impairment. And you, when you, when you have someone who's 60 and you want to, you know, you can't get a history from their parents or get their report cards, right? Um, the natural history, the underlying neurobiology of adult onset ADHD is different and it's probably very unlikely to be ADHD, except in certain circumstances. When it's later life onset of inattention, it's not ADHD, it's something else. Um, could be vascular burden, hypertension, TIAs, many strokes, any number of things. But when, when the, the symptomatology changes in later life, that's 
of greater concern than something that's been long standing. Now, with respect to the details of your question, are concrete thinkers versus linear thinkers more or less likely to develop dementia? And the answer is um, there are so many other variables. Again, cognitive reserve, um, what you do with your brain, your diet, all of that, that to really separate those out would be would be pretty much impossible. I would suggest that there's very little difference when you when you weigh everything else in. What a fantastic set of questions. And a big, big round of applause. Um, well, on behalf of the synagogue and the TSED Talk Planning Committee, I just want to thank the two of you for coming and joining us. Clearly, we are so lucky to have your expertise and uh, great presentations and amazing knowledge of the scientific literature. So uh, once again, a big thanks for, for coming out. Um, so we look forward to your uh, thoughts and feedback, ideas for future uh, TED Talks, and I will pass the... No, I'm just going to reiterate what you just said, which was we welcome ideas about future talks. So if you have some ideas or suggestions of a topic that you'd like to hear, please let us know, and we'll definitely consider them. Great. Thank you, everybody, for coming. Macaroons, mandarins. Uh, have a great evening. <laughs>